things that the impact program forced us to think about is, is it possible that the very format we use for teaching is, is, is creating problems with some students? That is it possible that the large lecture format, by its very nature, isolates and sort of disenfranchises a fair number of students? That students don't do well in a large lecture format, particularly if it's an introductory course, particularly if it's the first experience they have coming into college. I mean, imagine if you were a student who was in a class, what were your class sizes in high school? Fairly small. My high school, the biggest class size is maybe 20 or 30 people in a class. And then you're asked to sit in the classroom of 500. You know, your teacher knew your name. Your teacher wasn't afraid to come talk to you and kind of help you through those things. To sort of hold your hand. Even in high school, you know, you had these advisors that talked to you. And then here you get to college and here's a class of 700 or more. It's kind of an issue. And so um, I was surprised to learn when we did the impact that there are these new kind of classes called hybrid classes that change really the way we deliver things and, um, and cause us to sort of rethink maybe lecture isn't the best way to do it. Another reason for me that made a big point was we can already videotape things. I can videotape myself talking and then have that treasured for future generations, joy, right? <laughs> and, but the point is, then I don't have to do it again. And you only have to do a class, you know, three or four or say 20 semesters before you start to feel like, I think I'm repeating myself. <laughs> And couldn't this, wasn't there a better way to get in contact with students? Isn't there a better way to have them learn the material before they come in and go out? And again, so what is a hybrid class? Hopefully everybody here knows. Have people seen this part of my presentation, by the way, already? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I will do this part. Let me tell you what's not a hybrid course. Here's not a hybrid. Class of 50, Roman Amphitheater, the Coliseum, right? As it goes along. Um, these are large lecture courses. They are designed by nature to entertain you know, to provide masses of information. Now, by the way, lecture is actually a really good way to communicate large masses of information quickly. And those of us who are adapted to this very interesting format can actually process large amounts of information quickly. So you all are very fortunate. You've been in this system for a long time. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this information, and luckily it will all go in there without flaw as I go back. Sadly, our students aren't always so well prepared, right? You know, sometimes you say something and it goes over their heads. And I also feel like it's very one way. It's incredibly passive. Uh, the students just sit back, and I always feel like Russell Crowe and Gladiator sometimes trying to entertain them, right? They say, well, how are you not entertained? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but of course, these days, there are better ways to entertain. I can watch Russell Crowe and Gladiator on TV or pay-per-view in my pajamas at night uh, instead of having to come in at 7.30 in the morning at a large lecture course with all my other fellow students. And we certainly know there are better ways now to learn information. And unfortunately, that's kind of what Khan Academy and some of these other online uh, resources have demonstrated. You can learn on demand. I want to know, you know, the, how to apply the Pythagorean theorem. Five seconds on YouTube, and I can find a wonderful animated description of exactly how to do that. And so then what's the point of a brick and mortar place like Purdue? Why come to Purdue if I can spend five minutes online and learn this stuff? Well, what we found is there's this thing called flipping the class that says, let's take advantage of the fact that Purdue has some of the smartest and brightest professors and students out there and actually get those professors and students together and get them to learn from each other rather than just have the professor boringly talking at the front of the room. Let's get them interacting a little bit. And the way to do this is we call flipping the class. So in your typical class, people heard of this, hopefully this is a review, right? Lecture in class, struggle with exercises at home. Flip classroom does exactly the opposite. They watch the lecture at home, usually some kind of introduction through video. Then they struggle with the exercises in class. They plug their way through, but at a time when you have help and personalized attention available. So now I can say, oh, did you get that, Tim? Did you, did you figure out, oh, no, I see you got a mistake there. So you can actually give direct feedback. And feedback is one of those things that we learn by failing. We learn by making mistakes. And that's why having a professor there to kind of catch those mistakes, to clarify, is so, so powerful. So, that's what we did. We actually did a team, for those of you who have done flip classrooms before, usually it's a single or a team taught class <laughs> where the professors record it and then they flip it and they do the interaction. This was actually pretty much the department. We got 10 of our Purdue psychology professors. The idea was each one of them are experts in their own particular domains. And at last, you can pause Purdue professors. You can stop them <laughs> and go through a your pace. And we thought this would be very useful for students. Because who among us hasn't been writing furiously, trying to catch up, and then, whoops, I missed. What did he say? At long last, <laughs> um, 
So you can pause and play through your place. You can also take a bathroom break if you feel <laughs> too much. And we know now the students have different attention spans, right? Ten minutes in, the students start to fade. Time for a dance. Certainly, no, well, we don't do that. But we'll have a break. Do you plan in your breaks? Student discussions? That's a good way to keep it going. Um, the other thing that's kind of nice about this is we can take advantage of all the professors we have. Professors that are teaching lots of other courses, but bring them in specifically to teach their area and their area of expertise. And we've actually started expanding that by doing more interviews and, and more uh, less uh, classroom kind of things and more intimate kinds of things. Uh, so you have many professors able to teach the areas that are their own particular areas of expertise. Um, the other thing that this is big for us, and it's been a concern for me for a long time, is consistency across sections. What does it mean if, if somebody takes a class and depending on which section they got in, they're going to either get an A or a C. And we could have that much variability. And if you're in one of those sections where the instructor is really hard grading or does something different, you can see. Or if you're in one of these instructors with that cake instructor, you could get an A. And, and does that seem fair that you could random basically depending on what random assignment you happen to get into, now random students try and avoid the hard instructors and find the easy ones. But depending on that random assignment, you now determine how their future career is going to go. They might either stick with the university or wind up dropping out. All on the basis of which introductory course they got thrown into, which section of which introductory course. So we kind of like the idea of having consistency, of getting all the professors together saying, what are your learning outcomes? What do you want the students to be learning? How are we going to be testing those things? And by the way, I can't emphasize this enough. This was a group effort. It's not like the head saying, you have to get along on board and do this. It's more like, hey, we want students to learn psychology. What are the things we all want them to teach? And we'll be very democratic about it and figure it out. But what are the main things you want them to focus on? What are your goals? And everybody's on board, and everybody wants to do that. Uh, plus, then they get paid for it, which maybe helps. Uh, but, and also, we have captions. So you can, for hearing accessibility and other kinds of things, there's actually captions in the lectures, which you can't do in a live lecture uh, for people with hearing impairments. And then our idea was to have live recitations with activities. So the live recitations with activities happen once a week. Uh, so instead of three hours a week, they watch about two hours of lectures online, and then they do the live recitations with activities once a week, where TA supervises. There's high interaction. They're set in this new uh, classroom we have in Hicks 848. Are you familiar with the classroom? That's what it looks like. It's much more group interactive. The students at the tables, there are whiteboards. Uh, in the other room, there are whiteboards in the wall, which, by the way, works even better. Uh, and it's student focused. The idea is the TA is there pretty much as a facilitator. They work through these activities, they're given a project to accomplish on an in individual uh, classroom period. They, and the idea here is they're developing skills. Skills of learning how to present, skills of learning how to work together, some writing skills, and also figuring out how the heck you apply this kind of stuff. There are lots of different things we were doing in here, which I'll explain as it goes, but my whole point of the live recitations is this has got to be better than online. This has got to be emphasizing why come to a place like Purdue. And I think it's the same thing with the Purdue new activity learning center that they're trying to set up. It's the same thing. Why do you want to come to Purdue? Because of this kind of stuff. There's active learning going on here where you get a chance to participate hands-on learning in something that hasn't been done somewhere else that you can't do better online. You've got the experts there to help you. You've got another friend who can help you work through these things. Um, and so that to me is, is not necessarily better online. And then we have lots of really interesting results that came out of this. So we ran this first in fall of 2011. Uh, we looked for measures of students' engagements. It's a little hard. You could, can of course ask them, are you engaged? And most students say no. <laughs> or you could ask them other indirect ways, like seeing what the attendance is like in these various sections. And it's worth mentioning that um, there's 60% attendance in the large lecture courses. That's actually pretty good. You know what were people's attendances in large lectures? You know? Depends on the stage. I, I, that, that was the question. It depends on the stage of the semester. Absolutely depends on the stage of the semester and things, but is 50% seem, 60% seem high, low? Some people get more? As an average? Yeah. Maybe a little high? Yeah, that seems high, high, actually, yeah. Because I mean, I've heard some people who get about 80% in large lecture, which they must be really good instructors. That's probably something we measure. But also in these, it averaged out to about 60%. Uh, in the small recitations, it's 95% attendance. Pretty good. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot better. Now, the interesting thing is they're not really getting credit. I mean, they're kind of getting credit for the participation point, but this is more, this is your chance to learn. Now, it could also be they only have to do it once a week. Mm -hmm. But 
the other thing there is they actually still, that's still better attendance once a week than most people attend. In fact, the average student missed less than one class a whole semester and compared that to a 60% attendance. So there seems to be about a student engagement. Then we ask them uh, open-ended survey questions. They really like the format. They like the flexibility in it. The other thing, too, is we talk about students being overscheduled. If you only have to set your time, and by the way, we've got 15 of these recitations all around the week, they can find a time to make it. Now, they are scheduled in the recitations, but sometimes if they miss, they could drop into another one. That's okay. Um, and then our measure of student success, one way of at least looking at it, certainly the way that the students like to look at it, is in the large lecture course, about 40% got to be your better first round of this. And in ours, they got 70%. That's probably a little high in the first round, frankly. Maybe we're a little overly nice. But on some of these other, but we actually gave them the same test or some aspects of the test, and they got similar scores. So it wasn't that they were necessarily not, they're learning less or being overly uh, generous with the grades. But from a student standpoint, 70% of them were getting a, a B or better. Now that has dropped a little bit, and you'll see in a second. Uh, there are other ways that goes. Um, and there are a couple other measures that we looked at, too. We looked at course ratings, and we found the course itself got bumped up. This is not a terribly popular course. It's as well 3.5, you can see, uh, for the lecture course. But when it's a hybrid course, they can incorporate to more and more. Um, interesting enough, the graduate assistant ratings got higher whether it was a large lecture course or a you know, hybrid course. So the hybrid course, they actually read the same graduate system as better, more likable, better TA than the smaller course. And again, that could be due to class size. And then one of the key questions, do you think this format, do you think this, this course is conducive to learning? And they say, yes, of course. That's, that's one of the uh, typical qualitative uh, comment on the part of the students. I love this hybrid course, being able to listen to lectures in my own time and then discuss them during the once per week recitation was great. I'll pay them to say this. Many of them did. You know, it's, it's nice, it's flexible, it's my own time, and it's, it's another way of approaching it. And increasingly, more and more students have done these flipped classrooms before. We're seeing many students, have you done a flipped classroom before? Yes, they've seen it, they know about it, and they pretty much love it. Pretty much. Questions? So this, these data came from the first, first round? Okay. We've got a lot more data showing up. Uh, although for me, as I've commented before, the most revealing thing about Site 120 is we went from a large lecture class size that ran anywhere from 200 to 500 students, large lecture courses assigning big things, to a class size that was somewhere around 40 to 80. And I just, people have heard me say this before. I walked into one of these classes and had a class that was right there. It was a class of 40, just 40 people. And it's such a different atmosphere when you're talking to them. You know, I think I'm talking to a class of 800 or 40, you know, 400, it's just overwhelming, and you'd have to be almost psychologically damaged to want to raise your hand and say something. <laughs> and you never get that kind of interaction where in one of these interactive classes, they're smaller. You feel like you get to know each person. I sat around at each of the different groups, and it's just a much more social kind of feeling. And it felt, it made a big college feel like a small place. And I think generally speaking, that's probably a good thing. Probably. I keep adding these caveats. Hmm, what are you talking about? So I guess what I'd say, you could watch a large lecture and be mildly entertained, or you could actually come to a recitation and participate um, and learn how to actually apply this stuff in your life in the real world. And so you could actually learn the material. So this is the kind of thing that I tell the students. 